Hello, all. Welcome to ETF Edge, your go-to place for everything exchange-traded fun. I'm your host, Bob Sassani. And of course, we're going to have a very interesting subject today, talking about the pending Coinbase direct listing IPO. It's actually just a direct listing. It's going to be this Wednesday, and it is eliciting an unusually uh, vociferous, strong uh, reaction, not just in the crypto community, that would be expected, but in the general community uh, and in the ETF community. We're going to explain why here. I want to talk with Matt Hogan. He's the chief investment officer of Bitwise Asset Management. He pioneered the first cryptocurrency index fund. Christian Magoon runs the Amplified Transformational Data Sharing ETF. That's BLOK. Uh, they actively manage uh, uh, a fund focused on blockchain technology. And my old pal, Tim Seymour from Seymour Asset Management, joins us as well with his wisdom. Matt, uh, you have told me several times uh, Coinbase is the asset the crypto community has been waiting for. But it seems like it might be one that other communities, the broader community, are waiting for. Why is this such a big deal? Can you explain it to us? Sure. It's such a big deal because it's the first large cap pure play crypto equity in the U.S. markets or in any markets. I mean, we're talking about a company with a valuation between 50 and 100 billion dollars. You and I have talked about this, Bob. That makes it bigger than Nasdaq. It makes it bigger than the parent company of the New York Stock Exchange. And the growth is so phenomenal that you can't ignore it. This is a company that 10 x earnings on a year over year basis. You just don't see this kind of growth from large cap equities. And every investor, not just crypto investors, are going to have to reckon with that growth, think about where it's going and decide if it belongs in a portfolio. And that just makes it a game changer for, for where crypto exists in the total capital market spectrum. Yeah. You know, Christian, um, what about you? You've got the probably the, the, the one I consider it the one uh, crypto ETF that actually tries to be really crypto. You actually own assets that appear to be, you know, crypto related. You own Nova Grants, uh, Galaxy Holdings Fund. Uh, but Block, are you going to be the buyer immediately of, uh, of, uh, of, of Coinbase? Ex explain how this is going to impact the ETF community. Yeah, so Block is an active ETF. So we'll be able to own Coinbase uh, on Wednesday. And uh, I expect we will. Uh, about 27% of the portfolio right now of Block owns companies that are involved in blockchain and cryptocurrency infrastructure. So these are payment companies, uh, custodians, exchanges. And to Matt Haugen's point, yeah, you know, we, we own a variety of companies like Voyeur Digital, Silvergate, Diginex, but these are small to mid cap companies. Coinbase would be the first kind of large cap company. So it's pretty exciting. We also think there's going to be other ETFs that will own this, uh, own Coinbase, Kathy Wood and ARC are likely to own it in their fintech ETF as well as their innovation ETF. There's some IPO ETFs out there. There's some other blockchain ETFs and a variety of filings of new funds coming to market in the next month or two that will be crypto sensitive. So it will be a big deal in the ETF space. You know, Tim, I, I just do not understand valuations here. I've never seen a, a nine times valuation spread here. I've seen numbers at 23 billion to value Coinbase. I saw 50. I saw 100. I saw somebody at two. How is it possible that we can't even get within nine times of the valuation of the company? And as Matt pointed out, Nasdaq's $25 billion. If it goes at 50, it's twice Nasdaq. The ICE, which owns NYSE, is $65 billion. I mean, come on. This is like mind-blowing numbers here. I, try to make sense of this for us. Yeah. Well, I'm not sure I can, but I think if you look at the profitability, first of all, of Coinbase and where they've come in, even on the estimates on their first quarter numbers relative to where they were all of last year. I mean, you're talking about two and a half times in the first quarter uh, on profitability at a time when we've seen IPOs that have been far from profitable tech companies. So um, obviously, this is a, a frontier that uh, the multiples on what people are willing to pay don't make sense. Uh, wh what is the imputed multiple on Square or, or other companies that have uh, talked about you know, being able to to you know, do Bitcoin transactions and crypto transactions? Um, we can name all the companies that have, have had significant market cap increases here. So um, I, look, it's it's exciting. It's exciting to have that pure play. I think that really is the point. And and where where it settles in is going to be, you know, also another issue. I mean, think about the move we've had in the underlying currencies, especially you know outside of Bitcoin and even in the broader uh, digital co token landscape. Uh, all of the focus on NFTs, and, and you get you get the perfect storm here for this valuation, which is all over the map. But, yeah, Bob, if I so, can just, uh, if I, yeah, go, go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. Go Bob. ahead. 
Uh, well, I was, I was just, just going to say, and either one. I think there's a good analogy here to an IPO that some of us may remember from 2012, which is the Facebook IPO. That came to market at a $100 billion valuation. People said the valuation was absurd. People didn't trust it because it was kids dressed in hoodies serving a new audience that they weren't familiar with. That's the same thing here. This is a giant company that's churning out real revenue and real profits, right? $800 million in profits in the first quarter alone is the estimate. So I think those valuations may not be as absurd as people think. It's just people aren't comfortable with this corner of the economy in the same way they weren't comfortable with Facebook back in 2012. And Bob, uh, one yeah, thing to still, keep still, an eye on too is is ICE. ICE has kind of some phantom. The NYC has some phantom participation in this area. VPC Impact Acquisition Holdings ticker VIH. That's a SPAC that's going to merge with BACT Holdings, B A K T Holdings, and that is essentially right. ICE's digital asset marketplace. So that's going to happen this quarter. So the NYC via their ICE ownership and founding of BACT will be in this game as well. So look for some of these right. other companies that maybe haven't gotten the attention to maybe get some follow-on yeah. benefits from the Coinbase listing. Well, 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 that's going to be good news, isn't it, Matt? I mean, I, first off, there's really an exchange. They make, they make their money by acting like, you know, exchange and charging a VIG for it. The, the VIG is pretty high as far as I can see. It's pretty amazing. I think the yeah. NYSE would love to have this kind of VIG. Uh, yeah. As they get competition, Matt, isn't it reasonable to assume the VIG is going to go down or am I kidding myself? No, it's definitely going to go down, Bob. No question it's going to go down. But the thing that's going to go up is the size of the audience that it's serving. Look, most traditional investors are still on the sidelines of crypto. They're still afraid of it. The first place, one of the first places they're going to turn as they start to reckon with this is Coinbase. It's the most trusted brand. It's the largest company. It's the most established. It's been running for nearly a decade. Uh, so, yes, the, the profit margins are going to go down. The costs are going to go down significantly, particularly for Bitcoin. Maybe not for the other assets, but particularly for Bitcoin. But people are underselling how much broader the audience could be. And I think that's that's the flip side, the yin and the yang to this equation. Right. So will this create new companies, new ETFs? I mean, the problem in the past with crypto has had the same problem with pot and, and the same problem with space. There's been a, a lack of investable assets, particularly a, a lack of reasonably large investable assets. Now you have a, a, a company with a valuation, pick a valuation, $50 billion uh, that comes in that's huge. Uh, it's magnitudes of order bigger than anything else. Um, and uh, Christian, describe what that's going to do for the ecosystem. Will we see new ETFs built around it? Will we see a rush of new, smaller uh, cryptocurrencies come in as a result of this? Obviously, it depends on how successful it is. We're assuming it's going to be successful. But what, what, what's the knock-on effect here? Yeah, so for, I think for capital markets, we're going to see more private companies go public because they see the path, hopefully, that Coinbase takes that recognizes uh, the value in the public marketplace. On the ETF side, I think there's at least four other ETFs that have been filed in the last month and a half that are going to focus on crypto and blockchain uh, uh, sensitive companies. That's what we do at Block, third best performing ETF of the year, over a billion dollars in five star rated. So, you know, we've been there, but there will be others that will take this approach and there'll be different methodologies, weighting schemes, active index. So yeah. I think this will be a new asset class in the ETF space that will be built out beyond the two or three funds that exist today. Yeah, and I just hey, want Bob, to point out, folks, I also want uh, go ahead. Well, I was just going to simply say, because you also referenced the, this institutional dynamic and the investability of an asset class that, that both Matt and Christian have, have really emphasized, you know, the, the, the wall of money um, that's going to come in behind this or the, the institutional investability is really the issue. And you, you mentioned other asset classes. I know we're going to talk about uh, cannabis in, in a bit, but but that's really the dynamic here. Think of the institutions. And, and I know there's been a lot of discussion about um, if, if you know, corporate treasury put you know, 2 percent of their assets into, in, into digital uh, tokens and, and digital assets, what that would mean. But, uh, you know, that is really, I think, the dynamic and why so much attention and so much, you know, I think, intrinsic value is being applied to Coinbase. 
Yeah. Christian, uh, uh, I just want to point out to make sure the viewers understand how big this is. If we could put back up uh, your 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 main holdings. So, for example, I mean, and I laud you, you made an effort to really go out and, and, and buy true companies, not companies that are very peripherally related to it. But uh, Voyager Digital, for example, you own five percent of your holdings. Uh, Galaxy Digital, that's Michael Novogratz's uh, company. MicroStrategy, that, that's a software company, but it's essentially becoming a Bitcoin company. My point is there's not, and there's Voyager too, uh, Marathon Digital, High Blockchain. There's not a lot to buy. I mean, Novogratz's company, uh, Galaxy Digital, um, Christian, is what, $3 billion? It's It's tiny compared to uh, to Coinbase that may be, um, again, picking a number here, $50, $50 billion. So I laud you for your efforts to own stuff. There's just not a lot to own. That's why this thing is so extraordinary, right? Yeah, we think so. I mean, we thought there could be a pure play when we started this about three and a half years ago. It's gotten purer and purer. And now the, the really the opportunity, I think, could be with the Coinbase uh, direct listing and then uh, really the analysis of Coinbase valuation, there could be a revaluation for this whole segment higher uh, when you see some of the uh, numbers that come from Coinbase, you know, if Coinbase is valued between 50 and 100 million, what are some of these other, you know, exchanges, whether that's a, a Diginex or a Voyager digital worth, should they be revalued? Yeah. And I think that's the opportunity beyond just a larger uh, group of investors adopting cryptocurrency and, and blockchain technology in general. Matt, I got to ask you the eternal question. Uh, does this improve at all the chances for a Bitcoin ETF this year? And, and what, if anything, will? You and I have talked in the past. Is There's a little bit of a political change in Washington. We have Gary Gensler now. Uh, I'm going to ask you, does Gensler being there improve the chances of a Bitcoin ETF, number one? And number two, the SEC laid out a very clear set of problems they had in rejecting prior Bitcoins, including the Winklevoss uh, applications, twice. Uh, they rejected it. And they basically came out and made it very clear. We are concerned with fraud. We are concerned with custody issues. We are concerned about the fact that a lot of it trades overseas where we can't control any of it. H has there been any move towards curing those those defects? Aside from the political change, are we any closer in addressing the SEC's issues? Yeah, we're absolutely closer, Bob. Whether we're all the way there or not, I don't know. But we're absolutely closer Look, when the Winklevoss first filed for a Bitcoin ETF back in like 2013, there were no institutional regulated custodians. Arbitrage spreads were all over the place. The CME Bitcoin futures market didn't exist. There weren't crypto funds that had gone through audit. The crypto industry, and we've been talking about this on the show, has gone through this massive institutional maturation. Every aspect of it has, it imp has improved significantly over the past five years, over the past three years, and over the past year. Coinbase going public is just another part of that narrative. So absolutely, we're getting closer to a Bitcoin ETF. I continue to think it's a matter of when and not if, but we're not all the way there yet. The SEC has been asking good questions and companies like Bitwise and others have been working to address those. But I, I do think we're getting closer, Bob. I really do. So just to highlight this, the, the, uh, I believe the SEC acknowledged the Van Eck uh, application uh, a couple of weeks ago. They've acknowledged, uh, I think, Wisdom Trees as well just the other day. So uh, I think they have 45 days to accept, reject or kick the ball down the road. Uh, my understanding is that they've always had up to 240 days once they acknowledge it. Is that correct, Matt? So, so potentially they could kick the can down the road for a, a while now. But your, your point is, regardless, you think it's much more likely this year. What about Gensler? You didn't answer that question. Is, is, everybody seems to think Gensler is more sympathetic. It, it, well, what's is great that, about are you in that camp, too? And that well, what, what we know about Gensler is we know he's an expert on the space, right? He's taught a class, class at MIT on Bitcoin and blockchain. And all Bitcoin and crypto companies like Bitwise are looking for is a fair evaluation on the exact facts and circumstances of the market that exists today. So it's it's great that he's an expert, but really the questions that the SEC has asked over the last handful of years have been fair questions, and it's been the responsibility of companies to answer those. Like I said, fortunately, the market has matured rapidly that I think we have much better answers today than we did in the past. Does, does Gensler coming in help? I think it helps in that it's a new administration, a new fresh set of priorities, and that he's an expert on the space. But I don't think there's any magic sauce. The market has to be good enough, has to be institutional enough, has to be mature enough to support an ETF before the SEC green lights one. 
But the good news is I, I do think we're closer to that point today than we were in the past. And I, I really think we're getting there.